Beautiful singing church. I am so encouraged every time we gather, but my soul just soars when I get to hear you sing. And oftentimes, I've mentioned this before, I like to close my eyes and just imagine us before the throne together, worshiping our King. Thankful for a new uh, day and a new opportunity to open up God's Word. Let me begin with this question. When you were young, what was your favorite assignment? For some of you, maybe it was being a hall monitor. But for me, I really liked being the team captain. Did you like being the team captain out during recess and lunchtime? I realized that for some of you, you hated that responsibility. Just the thought of having to choose one person over another. You didn't vibe with that. You still don't like that. But for some of you, you not only love to be team captain, you love to be the team captain that chose first. Because you're just competitive and you want to win at all costs. And if you have that first round draft pick, that's going to help your team win. So whether it was basketball or kickball or dodgeball, you just wanted a little piece of that recess glory. And I, I get it. I wanted that recess glory too. But your strategy for picking a team, it changed drastically depending on what game you played. So you don't always pick the same person first. And that also applies to going in from recess and getting into the classroom when maybe the game is a spelling bee or a geography game. Well, in that case, you don't necessarily pick the strongest and the fastest. No, I want the girl that has read the dictionary multiple times and knows how to spell everything. Now, I want the guy who's traveled around and never misses school and can ace a geography exam. But as we come to our topic for today, my question for you is, is that how we choose leaders in the church? When we choose leaders in the church, are we looking for the most gifted, the most talented, the most skilled. The question is, are successful churches, fruitful churches, those churches that figured out who the most gifted people are? Is that the way that it works? And I want to suggest to you this morning that God has faithfully given us an authoritative word to realize that that is not how we choose church leaders. God has given us clear instruction on what we should be looking for when selecting our leaders. And the truth is that it has very little to do with abilities and talents. And it's not that gifting doesn't matter, because obviously gifting does, and a skill set matters in the church. But it doesn't matter more than character. And what God is always after is Christ-like character. What a person is, rather than what a person is able to do. You see, the most valuable asset here at our church is not how many talents and abilities and skills people possess, but how dependent on the Spirit of God we are in utilizing those talents, gifts, and abilities. And so the question I want you to think about as we move through our text this morning is, are you a spiritual person? Are you depending on the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and is your motivation, your intention to do everything for the glory of God? Well, we're moving away from our exposition in Luke because we're going to be talking about deacons today. We've hit on the role of elders in the church, but even tonight at our members' meeting, we'll talk more about deacons. But we're turning our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so if you have a Bible, grab it, turn on over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And again, when we installed Scott as one of our elders, we talked in depth about the qualifications for an elder. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's a twofold dimension of church leadership. The apostles, they had a concern for the infant church, and their concern was that the church would be led and governed and ruled and cared for and provided oversight by 
elders. That's 1 through 7. But now we come to verses 8 through 13. And I would invite you to please stand with me as we read this together. We're looking at 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 through 13. Here is God's holy word to us. It says, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not fond of dishonest gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And these men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife, leading their children and their own households well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. That is God's word to us. You may have a seat and please join me as we ask the Lord to bless the teaching of his word. Oh, Father, would you please help us in this moment to better understand the, the wisdom and how Christ himself has structured his church and the vital role that deacons play in the life of the church. And not just here, Lord, but in the great commission around the globe as churches, elders, pastors, overseers lead and deacons come alongside and assist and serve. Lord, this is your doing. This is your plan. Would you please help us understand? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here's our main idea this morning, if you're taking notes. And it's real simple. If you're called to be a deacon, you will be exemplary in your character, in your conduct, and your commitment to serving our local church body. And let me say this again, and let me actually plead with you to consider this because one of the reasons why I'm preaching this message is because we want you to step up. If you are called to be a deacon, you will be exemplary in your character, your conduct, and commitment to serving our local church body. And our outline for this morning is very simple. We're just going to look at three main points, three major headings. First, we'll start off with the definition of a deacon. This is what a deacon is. Then we'll look at the distinctives of a deacon who the deacons are. This is going to focus on their qualifications. And then finally, we'll, we'll touch on the duties of a deacon. And that is what deacons do. So what a deacon is, who deacons are, and what deacons do. Okay, let's jump right in. The definition of a deacon. Now here you'll see a, um, a helpful word picture. This is diakonos. That word deacon, it comes from the Greek word Diakonos, which just simply means servants. This word appears 29 times in the New Testament. And you have related terms like the verb diakoneo, which occurs 36 times in the New Testament. And that word, that verb just means to serve or to perform duties or to help. You also have one more word, diakonia, which occurs 33 times. And that just means service or Ministry. So that's the word group that we're working with. And you'll be familiar with plenty of verses where this word is there, but you don't translate it like that. You don't see the word deacon. You just see the word servant or servants or service or even ministry. So for instance, you remember that story in John chapter 2 when Jesus turns the water into wine. Mary comes and tells the deacons to do whatever Jesus says. There's the word right there. Matthew 20, 26, you're familiar with that passage of Scripture. As Jesus says, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your deacon, is what he says. Diakonos. Then there's a passage in Romans chapter 15 where it's even said that Christ has become a diakonos to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. So Jesus is the Lord and Savior and Master of all, and yet at the same time, here he's called a diakonos, a, a servant. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, What then is Apollos and what is Paul? And he says, We are diakonoi, we are 
servants through whom you've believed, even as the Lord gave to each one. Epaphras is called a diakonos. Tychicus is called a diakonos. And then in Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, we read this. Now I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a diakonos. Same word used there. She is a servant of the church. Look, every Christian is called to be a deacon in the sense of a servant. You are like Christ, living like Christ, serving like Christ when you are a servant. That is the most generic way the term is used. But there is also in the scriptures an office, an official office, a title that is given to those who are model servants, exemplary servants. We see that in Philippians chapter 1. When we open up to Philippians 1, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he says, Paul and Timothy, do law, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. In Matt Smimhurst's excellent little book, it's a little blue book from Nine Marks called Deacons, it's an excellent little read. He says this, deacons, rightly defined and deployed, are an irreplaceable gift to Christ's people. They are model servants who excel in being attentive and responsive to tangible needs in the life of the church. And you remember, early on in the book of Acts, the necessity for these deacons, these servants to step up. There was a very pressing and, and extremely practical need that the apostles needed to make sure that they employed people so that they would not be removed from their primary task of studying the word and preaching the word and protecting the people and praying for the flock. And so they insert men of the spirits gifted with wisdom to help in this role. And so that's kind of the precursor for this office of deacons. And we'll look at the difference as we move of deacons and elders, but it's worth noting that those differences, those differences are related to gifts and calling. It is not related to character. You see, too many churches, I think they lack clarity on what deacons are. And as long as you've got some skills, as long as that you can help us practically, let's put you into a role, a role of leadership in the church. And so if you can type a ton of words a minute, let's just make you the administrative person because that's what we need. If you're a generous giver, well, hey, this guy's given a lot of money. Let's just make him a deacon. If you're proficient with power tools, then you're obviously the facilities guy. Let's put you there. If you own a business or if you're good with money or if you're good with children, let's just insert you into a role. And that's typically how people think about deacons and placing them in leadership roles in the church. But do any of those people that I just mentioned, with, with those skill sets, do those people meet the qualifications laid out for us in the Bible? And the answer to that is possibly. We, we don't know quite yet. Certainly on the skill side, it seems like it matches up. But again, what is God more interested in? Character character. You see, the Bible doesn't actually tell us how gifted a brother or sister should be in order to be a deacon, but what it does stress is the character of that individual. That's why we must know, church, we must know what deacons are before we can employ them in service and take advantage of what they do. We need to know what the Bible says about the deacon's character, and that's what 1 Timothy 3 does for us. Matt also says, look, what you do matters, but who you are matters more. God cares more about your character than your gifting. So if there's anyone here who's thinking about potentially becoming a deacon one day, know that God cares passionately about your character. And there in verses 1 through 7, Paul, he lists all the qualifications of the office of an elder, an overseer, a pastor, all used interchangeably throughout 
the New Testament, an elder is a pastor, a pastor is an overseer, an overseer is an elder, but there's a distinction between that role and the role of a deacon, where he starts here in verse 8. Now keep in mind, as we look at this verse, that this is not exhaustive, this description. The, the moral qualifications listed for elders are also for deacons. Again, what I said, the moral qualifications, which is to say that we'll read real quickly that a deacon is not to be double-tongued. An elder can't look at that list and say, well, that's not there for me, so it's okay. They, they both go hand in hand, the moral qualifications. But here's point number two, the distinction or the distinctives of a deacon. This is who they are. And Paul lays this out really nice for us. Three negatives, four positives. He provides a structure as he lays out these qualifications. And let's start with just the overarching character quality, which is deacons likewise must be dignified. Dignified. Not, not a word that we often use, but that word is, just means respectable, honorable, noble. Actually, the word is literally serious. The, the King James Version translates it grave, and we don't use that kind of terminology, but you get the picture there. This person is serious, both in mind and in character, sober-minded, worthy of respect, the NIV translates it. A deacon is one who is highly esteemed. You look at him or her and you think, man, this person is respectable. They take their role and their service very seriously. And it's something that younger people or younger Christians look up to and say, I want to be like that someday. See them faithfully serving the church over so many years of great service. And again, this is not to say that this person is perfect. Every Christian is going to have issues and struggles it's not a matter of being perfect, but certainly blameless, above reproach. There is no glaring defect. There are not inconsistencies in this person's behavior. And so that's the conduct. That's the character, dignified. But then the question is, well, what does that practically look like to be dignified? And this is what Paul does. He gives the negative qualities first. And so we've titled these here just three things. They lack consistency. They're double-tongued, the Scripture says. They lack control, which means that they're giving, giving into indulgences. And they lack contentment. The text says that they are pursuing dishonest gain. So listen, if you want to be a deacon, if you desire to be a deacon, you can't lack consistency. You can't lack control. And you can't lack contentment. Let's take a look at these just individually. First of all, lacking consistency. The, the text says double tongue, not double tongue. Now, there are some who make the mistake of thinking that deacon work is completely just private work, right? You're, you're working behind the scenes. I'm not up there preaching. I'm not standing in front of people. I'm just, I'm just kind of putting chairs away and, and doing things on, on the low. No one really sees me. I don't have to interact with people. That's sometimes true, but for the most part, a deacon is going to be interacting with people. There's going to be conversation back and forth. You're working with people. So there's lots of conversation that is going on. There's planning that's involved. There's organizing that's involved. Not only that, but deacons have the, the, the responsibility of doing their best to maintain unity in a congregation, which means that they will be talking to others. Now, we can't have deacons, then, who are man-pleasers. We can't have deacons who are hypocritical. Deacons who are untrustworthy. Deacons who are divisive in their speech. That goes contrary to what a deacon is supposed to be doing. The, the Greek word, actually, dialogos, is just simply two words. Interesting. Two words. Someone who is double-tongued is someone who says something twice. You say, Dom, what, is, what does that mean? Is it, he has a stutter? Is that what that's saying? No. And it doesn't mean that he's unconsciously repeating himself. There's a very bad connotation here when you're speaking two words. And the connotation is this. You're saying one thing to somebody, and then you flip the script and say something totally different to somebody else. That, that's what he's addressing here. 
For, for those of you that read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, he mentions a guy on their journey to the celestial city that both Christian and faithful meet, and that individual is called Mr. Two Tongues. Mr. Two Tongues. Well, Mr. Two Tongues is eventually exposed for his fraud because he's deceptive, he's malicious, he's hypocritical. In fact, he's got a forked tongue is the description. He pretends to be a fellow believer and he pretends to be all about the mission, but in reality, he's a thief, he's a liar, and he wants to harm the pilgrims. You say, well, why would someone be double-tongued? Why? I think it's obvious. It's to make people think that you're something that you're really not. And that's why we say it's hypocritical. It's like Judas. Oh, Judas is there. He's watching and observing and maybe even preaching and amening the things that Jesus are saying. But on the side, he's got a little side gig and he's got his own agenda and he wants his own control. And he's probably speaking one thing to the disciples and something else to other people. We cannot have deacons, church, that are untrustworthy. We cannot have deacons that are unreliable, that are not credible. They need to speak the truth just as Jesus speaks the truth when he speaks. Every time Christ speaks, he's speaking with sincere words. He's not afraid to shy away from the truth, even when he has to say something hard. But he says true things for the good of others, for building up others. And that is what a deacon must do. He cannot be double-tongued. But there's a flip side to this, because it's not just the things that deacons say, but it's the things that other people say that the deacon needs to be aware of. Listen, you guys know that in the church, there's lots of gossip. People who want to divulge information and, and share juicy little secrets about what's going on in people's lives. No, a good deacon is going to hear someone begin to say a story. Hey, did you hear so-and-so why they're not at church this morning? Because I heard last night. And you just say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't need to know that. And you don't need to be talking about that. So, so a deacon not only protects the things that he says, but he protects the things that comes out or comes to his ears and makes sure that that doesn't get spread. You know that a rumor is unverified information. Deacons prevent rumors from being spread. Slander, false or malicious information with the intent to harm. Deacons prevent slander from happening. Gossip is telling someone privileged information about another when the recipient is neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. And a deacon will help guard against gossip in the church. Why? Because a deacon is all about preserving unity. Listen, if you're into spreading rumors, slander, or even just telling the truth but doing it with the intents to harm people, you should not be a deacon. Ken Sandy in his book, The Peacemaker, says, even if the information you discuss is true, gossip is always sinful and it's a sign of immaturity, spiritual immaturity. So listen, this is not me trying to, to slap your hand. This is me telling you from God's word that we all need to examine the things that come out of our mouth. You say, well, is that really that big of a deal? Oh, it destroys churches. I've seen it. It destroys churches. There are very few things that are as evil and sinister as gossip. That word, actually, gossip, it just means a whisper. Why would you have to whisper something? It's because it's a secret. And I don't want everyone to know, just you. See, rather than caring for another's reputation, people who are double-talking, double they fake concern. They don't speak the truth in love. They actually lust for attention. And a deacon, again, needs to be aware of this and address it as soon as it pops its ugly head up. Let me just read to you one quote by Ray Ortland, who gives us a warning of how destructive gossip is. He says this, Gossip leaves a wide trail of devastation wherever and however it goes. It erodes trust and destroys morale. It creates a social environment of suspicion where everyone must wonder what is being said behind their backs 
and whether appearances of friendship are sincere. It ruins hard-won reputations with cowardly but effective weapons of misrepresentation. It manipulates people into taking sides when no such action is necessary or beneficial. It unleashes the dark power of psychological transference, doing violence to the gossiper, to the one receiving the gossip, and the person being spoken against. And he says, look, it, it makes the body of Christ look like the body of the Antichrist. It destroys rather than heals. It exhausts the energies we would otherwise devote to positive witness. It robs our Lord of the church he deserves. And so what Paul says, you can't have leaders in the church that love to talk. You just cannot. Being double-tongued is being devil-tongued. And when you think about Satan, he is the biggest cheerleader with the pom-poms. He wants to see disunity in the church. And he's going to get that when people are talking when they should not be talking, gossiping when they should not be gossiping. And so let me ask you, church, do you have the reputation of being loose with your mouth or controlled with your mouth? Of being consistent with the things that you say? Of being the same here and here? We need people like that. We need people to speak truth. We need people to speak truth and do it in love. We need people to stop gossiping when they hear it start. That's what we need. Well, the first negative qualification has to do with consistency, but there's a second here. The second negative qualification has to do with control. Control. Look there at verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, and it says here, not indulging in much wine. Now, in verse 3, Paul says that an elder should not be addicted to wine. And you say, well, what's the difference here? Not not much. The the Greek word rendered addicted is translated devoted. It's just someone who's constantly thinking about it. They they commit their life to it. They, They enjoy it so much that it is a part of them. But like elders, deacons are supposed to be sober and self controlled. Now, what's prohibited here is not, listen to this, it's not responsible drinking. It's irresponsible drinking. Uncontrolled drinking. Drunkenness is what is the issue here. And I realize for some of you in your former life, you've seen alcohol just destroy. Destroy you, destroy marriages, destroy families, destroy jobs. I, I get that. And I do believe that we need to be on extra alert. But we also don't want to make the text say something that it is not saying. Because Paul, again, is not prohibiting drinking alcohol. He's prohibiting the abuse of it. That, that's what he's prohibiting here. Look, praise the Lord if you are a teetotaler. teetotaler? John Piper, uh, I've heard him on this. And man, I love John Piper. John MacArthur, same thing. But love those brothers, love their commitment to not taking any alcohol. And I say, praise the Lord for that. But there are other godly people throughout church history that have had a glass of wine or a glass of beer, and they're also godly. They're also faithful. Again, the prohibition is getting drunk. Nowhere in the Bible is drinking categorically prohibited. What's categorically prohibited is going too far. But, but I want to point something else out because I've heard people actually say, well, Paul prohibits drunkenness, but he don't say nothing about getting high. Look, the principle here is that you should not do anything that is going to impair your judgment. It's going to jeopardize your ability to think rationally. You, you need to be clear-minded, especially if you're in roles of leadership and you're dealing with people's souls Qualified deacons will not just not engage in those types of things, but really anything. It does come down to an issue of control. Listen, I might say, don't drink alcohol. You say, hey, Dom, no problem there. But if I say, hey, don't let your phone control you. Well, wait a second. That's a different story. But here's the reality. It is about control. 
So whether it's computers, whether it's video games, whether it's a hobby, whether it's your phone, whether it's binge watching on Netflix, the principle here is you must have control if you are going to be a deacon in the church. Self-control suggests restraint. And someone who is living a disciplined and controlled and orderly life is one that needs to model that kind of character for other believers in the church. And you say, well, is that characteristic of Jesus? Do you know anyone more self-controlled than Jesus? So listen, if you desire to be a deacon, one of the questions that you need to ask is, do I get carried away with things? Do I have self-control? Whether it's alcohol or sex or money or entertainment or, or desire for popularity, we cannot be without control if we're going to be leading in the church. So if you desire to be a deacon, you must not lack consistency. You must not lack control with your appetites. And thirdly, you must not lack contentment. Look there again, verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not fond of dishonest gain. You see, a deacon cannot be someone who loves money more than they love Jesus. Jesus actually makes a very clear point. You can't serve two gods. You can't serve God and mammon. Look, if you, if you love money, then you likely don't love Jesus. And if that's the case, then you really aren't a disciple. And so why would we think that you can be a deacon if you've got an infatuation with money? But now with that strong word, I want you to notice what the text doesn't say, because the prohibition here is not that you can't be wealthy. Praise the Lord if you're wealthy. The prohibition here is not that you can't make money. Make money. Praise the Lord for that. The, the prohibition is that you can't be good at making money. No, praise the Lord for that. The two qualifiers here are, are very clear. It is you cannot be fond and fond of dishonest gain. You know, when you think about diaconal work, deacons will have to be in charge of money. I just walked into the office to put my, my little coffee cup away, and there's a few of our deacons. There's multiple deacons keeping eyes on things. But the problem is that there are those who are deceptive, who cut moral corners, who like to cheat on their taxes, who like to be dishonest. There are those who are obsessive over money. And you say, Dom, how, how do I know if someone is not being faithful to this command here? Well, does the individual always talk about money? How much they have, how much they don't have? Does an individual like to fill their barns and talk about how they're filling their barns? Do they have a love affair with money? Listen, if the Bible is very clear that you're not supposed to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, you certainly shouldn't be letting other people know what you're doing with your money. I have a friend who found out that their secretary at their church was embezzling money for years. She was the sweetest little lady. Didn't look like she did anything sinful. And yet this whole time, she was just stuffing her pockets with God's money, the church's money. No one knew, no one saw, but God saw. She had embezzled over $70,000 of the church's money over years. Listen, if you desire to be a deacon, that cannot be characteristic of you. You have judgments hanging over your head. If you're going to take God's money and love it for yourself. So listen, deacons, they're dignified. They're clear-headed. They're self-disciplined. They're faithful. That, that's the banner that hangs over them. They're not double-tongued. They're not addicted to much wine. They're not greedy for dishonest gain. If the deacon is full of the Spirit, then these things won't be an issue. 
And so that's the key. Are you Christian, full of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, loving the Spirit, going to the Word to get full of the Spirit? The Scriptures say, Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. Now Paul gives the positive qualifications. He's going to mention a number of things here. Number one, he's going to continue to promote the faith the deacon will. He'll be confirmed by others. He'll be careful in conduct. And he'll be committed to his wife and his kids. And we'll move through these fairly quickly. Verse 9 says this, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. I love that. Now the question here, though, is what, what does that mean? What does it mean to hold to the mystery of the faith? The, the NIV, I, I like the translation there, it just says the deep truths of the faith. In short, the mystery of faith is the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. And verse 16, if you look down at verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, I think it helps us, because there we read this, and by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifested in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Listen, that is the message of the gospel. And every single deacon, even though they're not charged to get up and preach and teach, they should know this. That they should love the gospel, know the gospel, proclaim the gospel. Listen, if you're new and you haven't heard this before, you need to hear this. That if you are a Christian and you're claiming Christ, you don't have a pass because you're not an elder or a deacon. Every single Christian needs to be very clear in their mind about the gospel. Which is why when you become a member here, we go through a membership class. We have you give the gospel in how long? A minute. The, the very best you can condense what the, the meat of the gospel is. Because we want all of our members to not just be familiar with it, but be able to articulate it very clearly. And the scripture says here, they have to hold this. They have to do this with a clear conscience. Meaning that it's not just something that they can recite, but it's something that they actually live. So I'm not just saying this, I'm living this. This isn't just something that I think is cool. This is my life. So the deacon, he continues to promote the faith. But secondly, the deacon will be confirmed by others in the congregation. Look there, verse 10. And these men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Now, I don't think that this is talking about a, like a literal exam, a test. You know, in seminary, you have to take an ordination class and you have to memorize all this stuff. And when I became an elder at Grace Church of the Valley, I was shaking in my boots because I was in front of everybody and Scott Artavanis was giving me a test in front of everybody and he was asking me theological questions and, and practical questions. And I was sweating. It was hard, but it was so good because it was being affirmed by the people that, hey, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. That that's not the case necessarily here for deacons, but what this is saying is that you need to give time for the congregation to observe the character and observe the competency and observe the consistency of this individual. But we don't want new believers. We don't want people who we don't know stepping up into roles of leadership in the church. And so the character and conduct must match the qualifications. And so we ask questions as a church, and you'll see this tonight in our meeting. Is the prospective deacon, are, are you mature? Are you a growing Christian? Again, this isn't, you need to be perfect. This doesn't mean that you need to read all the systematic theologies, but, but do you have a longing to be honoring to Christ? Are you growing in your faith? Are you growing in your Christ-likeness? Are you contributing to the growth of other believers here at the church? Does the prospective deacon, does he show competency in an area of service? We don't want to put someone with the finances who can't add. Is there anything that disqualifies you from serving? And is the congregation supportive? That's why we actually ask for nominations. We want people to say, hey, I've seen this. I've, I've observed this faithfulness. I love the way that this particular individual helps in this area of ministry. And so we want to hear your own nominations. Now, 
Before we get to number three, careful in conduct, we're going to take a quick little detour because this is a big, big interpretive question. Look there at verse 11. A big interpretive problem. Does 1 Timothy 3.11 refer to deaconesses or to the wife of a deacon? Now, for the members here, you know because, well, you're a member here and because we have deaconesses. It's on our website. It's in our documents. But that's our position here at Grace Church Monterey Bay, that a woman not only can, but a woman should. So, so just so you're clear, I haven't been preaching just to the men today. I'm preaching to men and women. We need male deacons and female deacons. But you realize that not everyone believes that. Not all churches practice that. There are some that contend that that should not be the case. And I want to be very clear here that when we're talking about the role of an elder, pastor, overseer, that is very different. Because the clear command there is that those must be male. But when we're talking about the role, the office of a deacon, it is both male and female. And again, let me just say at the outset that I don't think this is a hill to die on. I don't think this is a reason for you to uh, cause division in the church. I think if you hold to strong convictions and you feel like maybe this church and many other churches are wrong on this point, and it's something that you can't keep your mouth quiet about, then just go somewhere else where, the, where you agree with them. But as we take a look at this, I think we come to the persuasion that, yes, women can be deacons. And we can't get through all the weeds. There's, there's lots and lots of books written on this. But let me just highlight a number of things for you, just to give you a little taste. Again, look there at verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified. Now, the reason why there's even an interpretive challenge is because the word here, gunekos, it just means woman. And actually, the Legacy Standard Bible, if you have that right in front of you, that's what it says, because I, I believe that's what the translation is. If you have the King James, if you have the ESV, they render this word, not women, but wives, which I think is confusing. There, there is no specific word for wife or wives in the Greek text. Now, our understanding of a wife is always based on context. The only way Paul could refer to wives or deaconesses is with the word woman, and that's the word that he use, uses here. But, but since the context is about deacons, the meaning woman here probably refers to a female deacon. And then you think of the other options Paul could have had here. He could have used a possessive, a possessive pronoun to talk about their women or, or their wives, he could have used the genitive construction to express the woman of a man or the woman of a deacon, but he doesn't. The, like I said, the Greek word for deacon can be masculine or feminine. And so when we read about Phoebe, who is definitely a female, because that's what the text says, it calls her a deacon. If this is speaking of deacons' wives then it just seems a little strange that Paul is giving qualifications for deacons' wives, but he doesn't give any qualifications for elders' wives in verses 1 through 7. And listen, let me again just try to be as clear as possible. The only office specifically restricted to men in the Bible is that of eldership. Because of the headship that God established in the creative order, now, a passage of Scripture that maybe some people don't like. I know there are churches here on the peninsula that, that don't agree with this. But I want to show you. Flip on over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Again, we're dealing with the Word of God. We're saying what the Word is saying. Verse 11. A woman must learn in quietness, in all submission, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And for that, we just say yes and amen. And I, and I know that does not sound like something to say in our culture, but that is what the text says. But we need to make sure that we're not making the text say something beyond what it says. You see, in the context of 1 Timothy, this seems to be a restriction just on the authoritative leadership in the church. Women are not prohibited from teaching the Bible. Women are capable teachers of the Bible. In fact, we see 
In a relationship with Priscilla and Aquila, the discipling of Apollos, who eventually becomes the pastor of the church of Ephesus. They're helping him understand the gospel more clearly. Then we have that beautiful picture of Timothy's grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, who are teaching Timothy the scriptures. But when we take to light all of the New Testament passages, the passage here in 1 Timothy, it's not restricting women from all types of teaching and leadership in the church. It's restricting them from the authoritative elder type of teaching and leadership in the church. I just want to make sure that you're clear that we value our women, we love our women, our women are gifted, our women are essential to the health and the discipleship of our church. And so I don't think Paul is forbidding women from serving in this capacity, and that is why we have both male deacons and female deacons. And you say, Dom, well, I'm still not convinced. Well, you can look at church history. And again, I know that church history is not the deciding factor it's not the same thing as doing exegesis, but you can go all the way back to AD 111, Pliny the Younger writing to Emperor Trajan, talking about female deacons, deaconesses, Clement of Alexandria in AD 150. Listen to what he says. We are also aware of all the things that the noble Paul prescribed on the subject of female deacons in one of the two epistles of Timothy. But it doesn't stop there. There's origin of Alexandria, in AD 184, he says this of Romans 16.1, it teaches two things, that there are women deacons in the church and that women who have given assistance to so many people and who by their good works deserve to be praised by the apostles ought to be accepted into the diaconate. I just think sometimes people don't go back into history and say, well, what did the early church think? Well, there you go. Olympias was a widowed deaconess of the church in Constantinople in AD 368, and she leveraged her wealth to support the ministry of the church. And you know people like John Chrysostom and Gregory of Nazianzus, and she supported their ministries. Not only that, but Jerome and John Calvin and Charles Spurgeon and John MacArthur and John Piper and others all believe that women should be deacons. Now again, there's another side to that, and there are those that don't think, and there are people that we love and respect and value. But again, this is not a primary issue. It is a secondary issue. And so again, we're not going to make this a cause of division for our church. Okay, now back to the qualifications, and I'll be really brief here. Careful in conduct and committed to his wife and kids. Look there again at verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified, the overarching characteristic, not malicious, malicious gossips, which we've talked about, but temperate, faithful in all things. And then he switches back to the male deacons. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife, leading their children and their own households well. Listen, like elders, male deacons are to be a one woman man. Okay? No, no, it's not saying it's not talking about polygamy. It's talking about in their affections, in their thoughts, they've got one woman that they are committed to. And they also have to be the kind of dads at home who lead well, who manage well, who provide for their families, who are present with their families, who serve their families. And their kids look up to both mom and dad and recognize, no, we respect them. We love them. They're not perfect. They're sinful but they're doing a great job. And there you go. The definition of deacons, the distinctive of deacons, and real quickly, turn over to Acts chapter 6. Let me show you the duty of the deacons. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. We read there, now in those days, while the disciples were multiplying in number, there was grumbling from the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not pleasing to God for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this need. 
Now, the seven men here that are chosen, well, not specifically called deacons. They provide the, the prototype of the office that would come later in the church. And Luke doesn't tell us exactly what these seven men actually did. What we are aware of is that they solved the problem. How do they do that? I don't know. You don't know either. But they solved the problem. And look there at verse 7. We know that they solved the problem because it says here, and the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to multiply greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And I would just summarize it by saying like this. You know what deacons do? We've learned that they're shock absorbers, but they just take care of the practical and administrative needs of the church to keep the church running smoothly. And that's why we need you. As the church here continues to grow by God's grace, we need more and more people to step up into vital roles of ministry. And again, you say, well, I don't want to be a deacon. I don't have a desire to be a deacon. That's perfectly fine. But I want to challenge you, why not? Because it, sh it certainly shouldn't be that you're not aspiring to these characteristics. Every Christian should. But if you see a need, and you know that God has gifted you, wired you, given you the skill set to meet that need, then we want you to consider stepping up in a role of leadership and becoming a deacon or a deaconess. And again, you say, I really don't know what to do. Well, you know how to serve. If you just look here, service, daily serving, serving tables, serve. Serve. That's what the scripture is calling you to. And when you do that, listen, you're not only serving the members of the church, but you are serving the ministers of the church, Scott and I, very well. You don't want me doing math. I am not good at it. But Jordan is. He's specializing, you know, like a triple doctorate in math or whatever he does. You want him doing that. Look at verse 4. It says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the service of the word. And this word pleased the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and the others. So listen, pastors are called, they're commissioned to pastor, to shepherd, to pray, to preach, to protect, to preside over the ordinances. And the deacons come along and just assist them to get the job done for the glory of God. Listen, I'm so thankful for our servants here at our church. I'm thankful for Jess and her involvement with the women's ministry, leading the women, teaching the women, raising up other women. I'm thankful for Amy and her hospitality. Every time someone comes to the church, there's a little glimpses of Amy as people are just felt so welcomed and cared for. I'm thankful for Terry and the way he cares for our members and for our facilities. For Aaron, who's so vigilant with media and for his team with Regis and Seth, I'm thankful for Justin and the sound. I'm thankful for CD and his girls who come and help with the communion setup. I'm thankful for Nate and the job he's doing with our ushers, for Brother John, who's always on the grill cooking up some good stuff for men's barbecue and, and everything else. I'm thankful for David and Michael and their attention to our military community, for the things that Michael is doing with our media and website, for Elizabeth and office administration for Teresa and Tia and the ways that they serve our children, for Vinny and Janelle and what they're doing in high school ministry, for Marcus and Jordan and the finances and so many others who are giving of their time, their energy and talent to be a blessing to this church. And I just want you to hear me say this just personally to you, church. I am so thankful that you free me up to do exactly what I'm doing here. And as we continue, like I said, to grow as a church, and grow in health, we need more people who say, put me in, coach. I can do that. I can serve. I want to do that faithfully because Jesus is worth it. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing for our church to have so many that are willing and able and gifted to serve your body. Lord, we know that we can't serve on our own strength. We don't want to serve in our own strength. Lord, we want to serve in the power that you provide. 
And so would you please continue to raise up faithful deacons who love you, who love your word, who are faithful to the mystery of the gospel, Christ dying, resurrecting, raising from the grave to provide atonement for sinners like us. Lord, may we treasure that, proclaim that. Thank you for the great work that you're doing here. And just one more example of your sweet work in the life of our church is baptism. And so we thank you for lives being transformed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.